Um, you know, um, when I was a little boy, and this is a long, long time ago. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> My mom had a friend, Miss Estelle, who, I guess this woman must have been before her time because she used to have the most beautiful nails. They weren't excessively long, but they were always painted well. And she wore a fragrance that was really impressive to this little eight-year-old boy because um, now I would imagine that in today's world she may have been drenching too much but the whole room would smell like this lady and as a little bitty boy I mean I, I thought this was the most glamorous woman in the world and I remember coming home from school one day and um, when I got in the house, I asked my mom, how long ago did Miss Estelle leave? And she said, how did you know she was here? And it was the fragrance she left in the room. And it's amazing what a fragrance can do, because a fragrance can bring back memories, and it can, it can stimulate emotions. The right fragrance can make you cry, right? Well, let's find out what God has done with that. Because it's more than just the natural that we're dealing with here when we talk about fragrance. The title of this message is The Fragrance of Anointing. The Fragrance of Anointing. And uh, I want you to turn with me to the Psalm, verse one, I mean, Psalm 133 verse, well, it's only three verses there, so Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. But there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Now, <clears throat> this psalm is really about the blessings of unity. But he uses two... I was going to say metaphors. No, these are not metaphors. These are similes. He uses two similes to illustrate this blessing. And the blessing that he's illustrating is that unity is like an oil poured forth. And it's like Mountain Dew, not the soda. <laughs> not the soda. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. Um, so what he's talking about is how it's diffuse, that it spreads out. And we don't always understand why God does something like that in terms of using two similes that kind of almost seem like they're, he could have picked better. But I want to focus our attention on the first one. Verse 2. It is like the precious oil upon the beard running down on the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. Running down to the edge of his garments. You know, the thing about this, um, he's talking about, I mean, the oil that's being, the specific oil being referred to is the special aromatic oil that was used for anointing the high priest. And this oil actually 
it was more like a perfume because it was very aromatic. But the point he's making is that it was running down on the beard. It was poured on his head, but it's running down on his beard. And then from his beard, it's running down to the edge of his garments. So what he's talking about is how this oil is diffusive, okay? That's the whole idea of this, that this oil is very diffusive. But the point I want to make about it is that it's aromatic. It's like a perfume. Because in the scripture, oil is almost always a type of the Holy Spirit. And this simile is illustrating the effect of the anointing of the Spirit. Amen. And here's the point. The fragrance of the anointing identifies the anointed as set apart to God. The fragrance of the anointing identifies the anointed as set apart to God. That's crucial. So, in order to understand that, let's look at the two distinguishing features of this oil. So turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 30, verses 22 through 33. The book of Exodus. We're going back a ways. Stay with me. Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also take for yourself quality spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much sweet-smelling cinnamon, 250 shekels, 250 shekels of sweet-smelling cane, 500 shekels of acacia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary and a hen of olive oil and you shall make from these a holy anointing oil an ointment compounded according to the art of the perfumer it shall be a holy anointing oil now the one of the distinguishing characteristics of this was that this oil had a distinct fragrance I mean this fragrance was they're very distinct. But the second is, now we can skip through some of this. But go down with me uh, to verse 30. And you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, that they may minister to me as priest. And you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me. Throughout your generations, it shall not be poured on man's flesh, nor shall you make any other like it according to its composition. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it, or whoever puts any of it on an outsider, shall be cut off from the people. The second thing that distinguished this oil was that it was strictly forbidden to be used in everyday life, meaning that it was only found in the temple. The only time you smell this fragrance was when you were in the temple. Again, the fragrance of the anointing identifies the anointed as set apart to God. Now, why was this fragrance so important? Let's look over here at Leviticus uh, chapter 1, verse 9, and I'll show you why it was so important. We're talking about the burnt offering. Now, there are five Levitical offerings, the burnt offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, the meal offering, and the peace offering. But the burnt offering, this first one, is a little different from the others because it is a true offering. It is given under no compulsion, meaning that all the other offerings are 
commanded by God as required by for certain conditions and occasions, right? Sin being one. But this one is very, very different. It says, verse 9, but he shall wash its entrails. Speaking of the, the offering. He washes entrails, its legs with water. And the priest shall burn all on the altar as a burnt sacrifice. An offering made by fire. A sweet aroma to the Lord. You see, the thing that made this oil so significant was that it was a sweet aroma to the Lord. It was identifying. The anointed as set apart to God himself. Okay? Now, in verse 13, verse 17, you have the same thing. But in verse 3, you see why it was such a sweet aroma. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will. At the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. Meaning that there was no command or compulsion to this one. If you did it, you did it because you wanted to. Okay? And that's what made it so amazing. Okay. We looked at the holy anointing oil. And we also looked at the two distinguishing features of the oil. But what is all of this about? I mean, why is this important at all? Here's the thing. God brought pictures all through the Old Testament of the things he wanted to show. And they were always pictures that showed his son. So turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. And let's see why all this was so important. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death. And to the other, the aroma of life. Leading to life. Here's the thing that makes this so important. Who is Paul talking about when he's talking about, now thanks be to God who always leads us. Who is the us? He's talking about those who carry the anointing. And them alone. You see, every born-again believer is carrying the anointing. But what Paul is speaking of is those who walk in the anointing. In other words, their life is a free will offering to God on that basis. They're like a living sacrifice offered to the Lord himself. And that makes them a sweet aroma to God. Now, we saw that this was a a sweet aroma to God. In verse 15 it says, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ. And we know that because if we are living our lives as a living sacrifice, if we are of our own free will surrendering all, completely dedicated to him, then our life is a sweet sacrifice, a sweet smelling aroma in to God. But we also can see from here, for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Verse 16, to the one we are the aroma of death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And, and who is sufficient for these things? You know, what he's saying is this. <clears throat> to the degree that your life is a free will offering to God, you are emitting a fragrance to God. And to the degree that you are emitting a fragrance to God, the people around you are aware of it. 
You see, there's something about a Christian who is truly sold out. There's something that kind of draws people to them. It's something that makes people just want to be around them. Or just the opposite, avoid them. So it's either drawing or it's repelling. But this aroma, to the degree that you are walking in Christ, you've seen it in your life. How that when you are truly committed and walking in him, people are drawn to you. You don't ask them. They just start telling you their problems and, and want to be around you. Yeah. And those are those who are being saved. Because to them... You have an aroma of life and your encounter with them pushes them on toward life. But those who are just determined to die avoid you like the plague because you're shining a light on them and they can't stand the aroma that you emit. Because the fragrance of the anointing is Christ. God's solution was not for you to get better. It was for you to be replaced. So that Christ in you would draw men to himself. The fragrance of the anointing is Christ himself being formed in you. In the Old Testament, God made pictures of this. But these are things that are kind of hard to see until you see the reality. Now, once you see the reality, the picture makes sense. Because I'm sure they didn't know why it was necessary to do all these things. But we do. Because what God was teaching is that through Jesus Christ, this aroma of life that you emit is a sweet-smelling aroma to God. It's what makes you so desirable in his eyes. You see, sometimes we get caught up with our own weaknesses, shortcomings, and failures. And we think, well... I, I, Probably not that good. But what you got to realize is that God was aware of all your weaknesses, shortcomings, and failures when he saved you. Everyone. And all your subsequent sins, shortcomings, and weaknesses, they haven't changed his mind. They're not even a shock to him because he knew them in advance. You haven't done anything in your life that surprised him. Because he knew it already. And he loved you anyway. Because through Jesus Christ, he is transforming your inner being. So that you are now becoming what he desires for you. And although your shortcomings and your sins, they trouble you, and you want, you want them out of there, and God does too, but you've got to realize that they don't hinder his love. They do not hinder his love because the work he's doing in you is for the purpose of making you a sweet-smelling aroma to God. And that aroma has the power of life and death for men because those who are moving toward life are attracted to you that you might help them on into life. And those who are determined to die They avoid you like the plague because they know that being around you 
is just the opposite of all they want. You know, you hear people always saying, well, how could God send people to hell? God don't send anybody to hell. <laughs> people find their own way there, you know. He doesn't send anybody. Quite frankly, you want to know how people go to hell? Find the people that duck and dodge you because of how, where you stand and you're seeing them. You're seeing why people wind up in hell. They don't want to be where God is. Because that is what the fragrance of the anointing does. It identifies the anointed as set apart to God. That is our hope. That is our prayer. And that is the work that God is involved in in us right now. In Jesus' name, we give honor to you for so doing, O oh God. Thank you. Hallelujah.